This is one of the most famous palaces on the planet. Inside are over a million artefacts. But 600 years on, these relics are looking their age. Restoring this palace is a huge job, which requires incredible craftsmanship and technology right out of a sci-fi movie. So, how do they do it? The Forbidden City in Beijing, the largest palace complex in the world and one of the most revered sites in all of China. For centuries, anyone caught entering these gates without permission would face instant death. Then, in 1925, they let the public take a look. And these days, the Forbidden City gets about 7 million visitors a year. But having the equivalent of the population of New York wandering around takes its toll. So, they're splashing out $250 million to give the old place a facelift. This team of restorers is working on some 300-year-old wall surrounds. They all need to be checked, repaired, and sometimes replaced. Each is inlaid with hundreds of finely crafted pieces made from different materials. It's like a really old, expensive jigsaw. And Miss Yang Iru is in charge of restoring it. This is a wall of the wall. It needs a lot of materials. 有玉,有贝壳,我们修复它呢,完全都是手工修复. It's incredibly complex work, but Yang has it easy compared to Zhang Hongjie. He's an expert jade carver, a gem highly prized by the emperors, symbolizing immortality. This is a very important part of the land of the land. Jade is one of the planet's toughest gems. Carving it without chipping it takes immense skill. It can take Zhang two weeks to finish just one small piece. If Zhang makes a mistake, he can always start again on a new chunk of jade. But that's not an option for all of the exhibits. Some of the items that need restoring are unique, far too delicate to tinker with. That's where PhD student Fa Jin Zhang steps in. She's beginning a trial program that uses 3D imaging to help create copies of 10 exhibits for the restoration team and others to study. I'm now trying to collect the digital data by 3D scanning for this five dragon bronze board. The imager works by projecting a very fine grid of blue light onto the object. Two 5 megapixel cameras then record virtual markers in the pattern, and the scanner uses these to build up a 3D image. The thing is, it's hard to reach behind curved parts of the dragon. So the team has to regularly reposition the cameras to shine the light onto every nook and cranny. Using this incredible technology, they can build up a 3D image that's accurate to 0.02 millimeters of the original. But this kind of precision takes time. We need to spend at least one to two days to collect the scanning data for the whole board. But getting the data is just the first step. The museum needs a physical copy of the exhibit. So now this 3D image has to be brought to life. That calls for some sci-fi magic, which happens 8,000 kilometers away in the UK. Here at Loughborough University, a team is breaking new ground in the science of 3D printing. Director of the School of Design Research, Dr. Ian Campbell, has just received Fang Jin's image of the bronze dragon from China. His computer breaks down the image and sends it to this printer. 3D printing like this used to be the stuff of Star Trek movies. 
Now it's a very real billion dollar global business. This printer here is very like your inkjet printer at home, but instead of printing out ink, it's printing out a liquid polymer resin. And when we shine light onto that resin, it turns solid, and that's how it builds up the solid material. The liquid resin is printed out, layer upon layer. Each layer is as thin as a dust particle and follows the pattern captured by Fang Jin back in the Forbidden City. It takes just three and a half hours to reproduce what would have taken a master craftsman months to create. It looks a perfect match, apart from the colour. But after a lick of paint, the reproduction is complete. Back at the Forbidden City, a few days later, Fang Jin receives the replica from the UK. It looks great. I'm pleased to receive it. This copy will be used for research only. But thanks to the magic of 3D technology, even an emperor will be hard-pressed to tell the difference. For a top gun, seeing your enemy before he sees you makes the difference between life and death. What you really need in the nose of your plane is the latest radar technology. So when it comes to designing and building radar for multi-million dollar fighter jets, how do they do it? Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. And the location of one of the UK's largest defence electronics businesses. CellXES. Here they build super small, super tough, super sensitive radar systems. As VP of Technology Mark Smith explains. The great challenges of radar systems is that it combines mechanical challenges, electrical challenges, software challenges, physical challenges of all different types, all in a very small volume, in a very demanding environment, and you have to basically build a, a, a supercomputer in a biscuit box. A radar works by sending out pulses of radio energy and measuring how long it takes for them to bounce off something and come back. Old-style radar relied on large, clunking, revolving dishes. Modern radar works the same way, but over the years, the parts have got smaller and smaller and smaller. But to put the systems together, you need more than delicate fingers, as engineer David Scott explains. Some of the components we place with this machine, there's no way we can do them by hand. Uh, some of the components are the size of a pinhead. At the heart of the radar is this small golden bar. This is a transmit and receive module, or TRM. This is what pumps out the radio signals and listens for them coming back. And there are around 1,000 of them in each radar device. These things are like nerves in a super powerful eye. They can even see stealth planes. You can scan the whole sky, present multiple targets, air targets, ground targets. That's all due to the advances in electronic scanning and the advances in computer technology. The TRMs are packed together to form what's called the radar array. Once in action, this array must endure extremes of temperature. So it's tested in a machine that's like a combined oven and fridge. David Smith is the man at the controls. We have to make these radars work at the most extreme conditions, weather conditions. So whether it's at the Arctic or on the equator, they must work. If the TRM array survives David's hot and cold treatment, it's sent for test number two. Behind these massive doors lies the compact antenna test range, overseen by David Reed. The the idea of a compact antenna test range is that we can simulate much greater distances than the physical size of the room. The purpose of this strange room is to test the accuracy of the TRM array. In flight, the radar must be able to detect very small objects, like heat-seeking missiles, travelling at speed at a great distance. David tests whether it can in a space just 15 metres wide. 
The chamber is lined with thousands of 30 centimetre high pyramids made of radar absorbent material. Much as you want to test a torch in darkness rather than daylight, this material allows David to attach the array of TRMs to the top of this robot arm and measure their performance without unwanted interference. Stop! Each test produces dangerous amounts of radiation. So David guides the robot into the chamber and moves to the safety of his office. The room is designed such that all of the energy produced by the radar does not escape this room. So although we're very close, it is very safe. Old-fashioned radars emitted powerful signals that gave away a plane's location. With modern radar systems, the trick is to use as little power as possible to avoid detection, but not so little that you can't see the other guy coming. We're testing the radar to ensure that it has sufficient power, for example, to make sure that we can see them before they can see us. Once the radar has collected its information, the next problem is relaying it to the pilot in a way which helps him respond in a dogfight. Richard Lundberg is a pilot who works for fighter jet manufacturer Saab. Today, he's testing the radar system in the latest combat flight simulator. Manual control. I'll tell the radar this is my prioritized target. Now the radar knows that that's my prioritized target and send that information to the missiles. I've selected a BVR missile, which is a beyond visual range. Pull the trigger and the missile goes away. The radar allows the pilot to track the target even when he's turned away from it, giving Richard a critical edge in combat. Now the target is to the left of me, 90 degrees, out to the left. So it still tracks the target while the target is about 100 degrees out to the left. So I'm actually flying away from the target right now. Once the tests are complete, the array of golden TRMs is connected to the supercomputer brain of the system, which is packed into boxes the size of biscuit tins. These are placed in the nose of the plane, along with a moving antenna. For the pilot, with the latest radar on board, it's like having the special powers of a superhero. Helping him bring the bite to any dogfight.